Hello, Rim the Most High God, and welcome to another edition of the Kingdom Intelligence Briefing. KIB's purpose is to provide an intelligence briefing for the body of Messiah that will both inform and empower the remnant in the last days. We want you to know that you're not alone. There are more of us than you realize. And the ranks against Mystery Babylon are growing all over the world. This is episode number 430. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Lake, and I'm in the KIB studio today with the love of my life, Mary Lou. Good morning, everyone. Uh, We're in the podcast studio on Monday morning. We've had uh, some events this week that we had to change the schedule, so we wanted to make sure we got the podcast up. Um, I'd like to start uh, the podcast with a prayer request. A couple of weeks ago, we had asked you guys to pray for a family um, that had an adult son, and both parents had covid And uh, I wanted to give you an update. Uh, The mother was able to stay out of the hospital, and she's continued to to improve. The father went in the hospital, but has since come home and is improving. But they received um, a bad report yesterday about their adult son. He's on a ventilator, and um, we need a miracle. And so yes. we know the importance of us all agreeing in prayer, and we just ask you to, to join with us and ask for a miracle that his lungs would be healed, that his immune system would be yes, strengthened, that he would uh, he, he had had a fever several times, and so we're just asking God for miraculous healing, ask for strength for the mom and dad during this time. And uh, we appreciate you guys so much. Your prayers mean so much, not only to this ministry, but everyone that you're praying for. It's I think it's just miracle working power that flows when people come into agreement in situations like this. So we just ask you to continue to pray for them, please. I don't know if you guys watched the State of the Union address this last week. I, cu- I couldn't stomach it for long, <laughs> but I, I watched little bits. And what it was apparent to me is that uh, obviously they had got him – I don't know, through some kind of pharmaceutical <laughs> method to where he could stand up there for that long. But it was it was very condescending. Um, he seemed that he was going to, um, you know, inform us that we don't know how good the economy is. <laughs> and, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist when you go to the grocery store and you see how high the prices are, uh, when you see the... the the contents of the bags and whatever you're buying is shrinking for the same. You know, they're trying to hide the increase. Um, every place you turn, everything's going up. Rent's going up. People, I mean, people can't afford their mortgages right. anymore because they keep going up. I mean, it's, right. uh, you know, it kind of reminded me of a grumpy old man that they, they gave caffeine and he's mad that they woke him up or something. Well, it was, was, there was a lot of anger. I guess uh, I, was just, I was just um, more sad it, it was just sad to me that because I mean he's he's a puppet. Yeah, he and, is a and puppet. That, none of it was based on truth. None no, of it. and so uh, we just continue to believe what God told me years ago. I stand on that that word that He gave me that He's taken the nation back. I think there's going to be some shaking, but I also believe that we are getting ready to see miracle working power like we have never seen before, and and God's glory actually come. I was listening to Jeremiah Johnson the other day, and I I just get such a kick out of him uh, because he's just he just tells it like it is, and he said he'd went to a, a church to pray, and there was a, a young couple came up and wanted uh, him to bless their relationship. And so he asked him if they were being intimate. Uh, I don't think he said it that delicately, but <laughs> we got kids listening. So, um, And they ended up like giving him the, the finger <laughs> and cussing at him and, and leaving because he had told yeah. him that he said, I can't bless this. He said, I'd be partaking in this if I put a blessing on it. Uh, and I think that shows you the state of much of the church today. We have been so put to sleep and we, we have so lost the paths of truth to walk in. And, you know, you, uh, so many people, you know, want to be blessed. They, they want God to bless them. And the easiest way to do it is something called obedience. Mm-hmm. That, I mean, uh, when God, you know, after, you know, following up the, uh, the ministry of Moses, I mean, that was a tall order for Joshua. I mean, unbelievably tall. It's like, okay, Joshua, did you part the Red Sea? Did you bring Egypt to its knees? And God says, listen, if you do the things that Moses told you that I said to do, you will make your way prosperous. 
that you'll be blessed because of, of being obedient to the covenant, of being faithful to the covenant. And the modern church wants to do everything but that. We'll throw money at it. We'll, we'll, we'll line up for hours for people to pray for us, but we don't go back and actually do what God said to well, do. Well, and it's not being taught today, the consequences of sin. No, it's not. Uh, and that's my, my thought. I've told you guys many times I was a big sinner. I understand being in bondage. I understand how difficult that can be to try to stay on the right path. Um, and I, I was you know, hearing from God this last week about... What happens when you don't know that you're in a spiritual war? And uh, I think that we can we can look at the state of the church and see what happens over decades of of things being preached that don't um, you know remind you of the consequences of sin and the the horrible things that that can happen. Yes, spiritual entropy takes hold. Well, you know, each I believe each person has a design from God and a planned path. But then the kingdom of darkness wants to get you on a different path. They don't want you to fulfill God's destiny for you. And so from the time you're in the womb, I believe the kingdom of darkness starts a plan. And especially if there's you know things on the bloodline you don't know about. Most churches haven't taught about generational curses, that those are doors that the enemy can use to start even in the womb to try to affect people and, and hinder them and, and harm them. You know, he wants to kill, steal, and destroy. Um, and Psalm 37, 23 and 24 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. And, you know, when, you, when you're in that path, when you're on that, uh, that safe path that the, the Lord has ordered for you, there's, it's goodness there. There are blessings there. But the problem with, with where we are today is... This path that even though is ordered by God is in the middle of a dangerous place where entities have gained great power. And, you know, um, a lot of people today are teaching that there's, there's no such thing as spiritual warfare. You know, it's just however God says it's going to be. And, and, well, then you'd have to explain 2 Corinthians 10.4 that says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And by not engaging in the spiritual warfare... Strongholds have not only remained, but they've been strengthened. And they've been strengthened by the very cultures around us that we are not being salt and light into. That's right. You know, they're, they're having a horrible time over in, in Haiti right now. And you know, Haiti's a, a big hubbub of voodoo, witchcraft, all these occult things. And they, they have a lot of problems there. And they're really in trouble now. We need to pray for the, the people in Haiti. There have been gangs that are gaining control, and they've, they've set violent prisoners loose. And so they, they're just really, I think they're even having a problem like getting food and just a whole gambit of crises. So we need to hold them up in prayer. But it's, it, I believe it's so important that we understand um, that, we're, that we're in a spiritual war. And, and because I feel like that, you know, there was, there was the wrong kind of spiritual warfare done where a lot of people just, you know, went after principalities and powers and, boy, their lives got destroyed and things like that because we can bind um, the kingdom of darkness and those principalities over our lives. We have authority over our ministry. But, but we can't you, bind them over a ge- geographical we, area or whatever. There is, is nothing in the, in the Word that instructs us to go against a specific principality. And so I think a lot of people really got in, in trouble with that. So I think when people saw that and saw that there was so much destruction, they just said, we're not going to do spiritual warfare. But the truth is, is, is it's a necessity for our children, our grandchildren. And I, I think even with this set apart from that, there was a uh, well-known Baptist seminary uh, that allowed one course to be taught one time, one semester on spiritual warfare. And it caused such havoc because all these guys... <laughs> studying for the ministry, started manifesting demons and everything else, that their response, instead of coming in and cleaning house spiritually, they just said, that's it, we're never teaching spiritual warfare again in the seminary. And because, but the truth is, them teaching it revealed what was always there. It had just been undercover. And, I mean, these guys had these bondages. They had this demonic influence, and these were guys studying for the ministry. And the spiritual warfare uncovered it, but no, this is too messy. And I remember there's a uh, proverb that says, 
where there is no oxen, the stall is clean. And the principle behind that is when the Holy Spirit's moving and working, when when you're you're having kingdom force, there's there's going to be some mess to begin with mm-hmm. as he's cleaning up, and we we've got to let him do that. And so there there is a balance that we have to do. We, either we can forget it, or we ignore it because it's too problematic to deal with. Let's 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 not rock the boat. Let's just keep things moving forward. And so bless their hearts, all these ministers, uh, they probably finished their master divinity or whatever, and they're pastoring now. And they still have all those same bondages that were manifesting that semester because nobody ever dealt with it. Well, there's been so many decades of, of not dealing with iniquity on bloodlines. And then you put in, you know, some people probably just need simple deliverance. Then there's others where there's an element of mind control mixed in, uh, occult practices, all kinds of things. And and the result is is the body of Christ is in really deep bondage. And, you know, when you, when you look at the early church, and, and I'm, I'm fascinated by the Anti-Nicene period, uh, there wasn't a minute and a half prayer to get somebody saved. They walked them through because they knew, Mary, they were coming out of a pagan culture. They had worshipped the gods of Rome. They had worshipped the gods of, of Egypt and, and Greece. And so they had to renounce those things as they received Jesus and saying, you know, you're realizing I'm being delivered from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. So, Father, I'm standing on, on the word that Jesus is now delivering me from these things. And, uh, I mean, even even Tetralian, after you accepted Christ, they wouldn't baptize you for two years to make sure that you were actually walking out your salvation in front of the, in front of the saints of God. And when they saw proof was in the pudding— that you were actually working out your salvation with fear and trembling, then they baptized you and you became mm-hmm. part of the Christian community. Well, and, and I think that's what God's doing with us right now. I think he's exposing things, obviously, on a worldwide level, national level, but in, in individually, so that we can fight this, this battle in the end times because um, the agendas of the enemy are being met with resistance. Yes, I mean, like I've never seen before. So his attacks will be greater. And so it's it's one of those times we have to look at, at the things that, uh, how he's gained so much momentum. And if there, we've got new listeners, so I want to just mention something briefly. Uh, most of you that listen to us know that we don't do uh, the regular holidays because of pagan influence and origins. And... Uh, I, I encourage you, if you're listening to us, to research Easter. Um, a friend of, of uh, our ministry, Gordy and, and Tanya, sent a, a link to something that they've done at Skywatch where um, Zev Parat, am I saying yeah. that right? And, and Carl Gallops. Uh-huh. Uh, were there with uh, Tom Horn's son, and they were, and he's he's done a new a new. Uh, series of teachings on thresholds i believe it's probably a new book and so uh he was showing me where they had had even talked about easter in there and and said how there there was this great uh, move you know to to try to take us away from the truth and get us to do something that was pagan and and i i can't wait to go back and watch that i've I'd not even heard of that about it, the it, thresholds it's and probably so, something brand new that just came out I think with, a, it with is. a new book i think it is and so i'm anxious to to read that and i was thankful that um but i mean we don't we don't even change the word because in egypt it would have been called ishtar mm-hmm. but in babylon it was called easter and and most churches will have an Easter Sunday service, and they will have a bunny there. Uh, they're going to ha- hide Easter eggs. And these are the very things that, that we've tried to warn people about for a long time because most people think, well, that pagan stuff's not what it means to me. But it's very clear in the Word that God says, don't take pagan things and turn it and do it unto him. And and that's this is an absolute. I mean, other... other um, of the holidays might be harder for people to see, but this one should be pretty clear if you research it and research like the pagan origins of Easter because it'll take you through Lent, going through the uh, 40 days of weeping for Tammuz. Uh, it's going to explain the pagan things. And, and so, you know, you may be going to a church where they do an Easter sunrise service. That's not good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's and that's why we went we have gone to just celebrating the feast. Uh, and, I, and I don't do it. We don't do it like most people. 
It, um, it's Jesus centric. It's it is, and and you know, like for the, the feast of unleavened bread, I know people don't like it when I say this, but I don't believe that we need to eat unleavened bread because I believe Jesus took he fulfilled the feast, yeah. and I was I was actually preparing it that way. I'd read a book on okay, how do you do Passover, and they talked about the seder, and you know they put an egg in in that Passover seder, and well that was added during Babylon, it was. It was. so eggs don't need to have anything to do with <laughs> well, with well, Passover. That and and uh, you know if we would concentrate to make sure that uh, as we're preparing for Passover that Egypt is outside. Okay, Babylon is outside us. It's not in our doorways. That there's no le- spiritual leaven of it in us. How much more effective that would be than going through your house and making sure that you don't have a bit of leaven in your house? That's right. And, you know, I think a Passover Seder is a good teaching element mm-hmm. that you can understand, you know, what was done and everything. But I, I just felt, um, I felt like God spoke to me and said, uh, don't take away from what Jesus has fulfilled, and and you know when you when you're going back and doing going through that ritual, then why are why do we need to do that when we need to be focusing on Jesus? Yeah. Took that sin for us. Yeah, and even even the way that we do it, and I think that there's a lot of things that we can learn by going through a Passover seder. Uh, but in a uh, letter that uh, Polycarp had gotten into a debate with another guy on on how to do uh, a Christian Passover, if you will. And Polycarp said, well, this is what the Apostle John taught me, that Jesus reduced it to bread and wine when he, when he took and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. And what's, what's interesting is in the Afikoman, there are, there are three sheets of matzah bread, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and, and each one would be taken out and talked about, and he'd pull back out Isaac and say, this is my body broken for you, because it co- connects all the way back to where Abraham was willing to give Isaac. Great teaching point. <laughs> great, great teaching. But he said, basically, he said, listen, this, this is what Messiah, because Messiah interpreted that feast and brought it down to the bread and the wine. And so that's, that's, that's what we do. And, but, but it has to be Jesus-centric, because if you go through all these things, and you, you don't bring Jesus into the dynamic of any of the feasts. The reason that we keep the Sabbath, it's a divine rehearsal of the millennial reign. And I can't wait, Barry, to where there are no f- stinking politics and all that, and Jesus is wonderful. sitting, <laughs> ruling, and reigning in Jerusalem. Uh, I, I can't wait for that. Uh, and so every one of them has to be Christ-centric. If it's not, then we have missed the point of them. They were moadim, they were divine rehearsals to prepare you for what God was going to do. We consider them high Sabbaths. We don't work on those days. Um, we, I just, I don't follow any of the Jewish traditions because I believe that they have pagan things incorporated into many of the things that they do. Uh, the only thing I use um, is uh, the menorah, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm just very careful what I do because I, I don't believe that Star of David is a good thing. No, I it, believe it's used by the occult, and even many Jewish experts believe that it was brought into Israel on the altar of Ashtaroth. So this, we just do the feast as a high holy day. We don't work. We, I have a meal. Um, it's not, you know. I love latkes. Sometimes I have them. Sometimes I don't. It just, it just depends. Uh, but we just keep the focus on Jesus, and and we just think that it's such a privilege to do those feasts oh absolutely uh, i don't feel like it's oh if i don't get all the leaven out of my house you know it's going to be a horrible thing no, but we need I, to get all the babylon we, out of this earth we search house. our that unleavened bread feast we search ourselves and say father show us show us areas that we need to to ask to you know repent of and and cleanse us of even when you when you do hanukkah it's, it's a time to make sure uh that uh, the temple has been rededicated and that there's mm-hmm. no no trace of pig, no trace of Antiochus Epiphanes yeah. or Greek influence uh, in the house of God. Yeah, that's right. Um, now, for the people that are, we've had several people this year ask us about the calendars, and we've always just followed the regular Jewish calendar um, because I believe technically for it to be done uh, according to the Bible, you have to know when that barley harvest is a bee. Yeah, and that's that's one of the problems I have. I'm, I'm reading through Ken Johnson's uh, books on the uh, Zadok calendar. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they call it the Enosian calendar, and and both the uh, rabbinical calendar or the Pharisaical calendar and the uh, Essene calendar both start with the spring equinox. Now the you know the logic is 
that uh, that was the beginning of creation because we went from death to life, and uh, you know God began speaking, and you know all those trees didn't start dead; they started blossoming and alive. And so they think it starts that way. And so both calendars start with the spring equinox, and both of them ignore the instruction of Moses to go back to the abeved barley harvest. That you have to see if that if that harvest is re- if if that harvest is ready to be harvested, and that you can have that first fruits offering when you get to the to the festival of first fruits. And that's. Something that the Karai calendar follows. Yeah, the Karai calendar. We've looked at that before. And we and what's interesting, when although it's not official, it's not the official council uh, uh, calendar of Israel. It, it's it's not only the Karaites, Mary. There are many uh, other Jewish sects as well as Messianics and Christians helping with that. And what's interesting is that the Palestinians and and the terrorists are so fearful of the barley harvest for some reason. Maybe maybe they've got a clue well, they, they might that have. Uh, they literally have to hire armored vehicles and armored escorts to go into the fields when they're checking to see if it's ready for harvest or not. Well, I can tell you from our experience is that um, you can just relax, in my opinion. If you're, if you're trying with all your heart to, to follow God and to honor him during these feasts, um, I don't think that there has to be some specific thing that, that you have to do. Just, you know, the reason that we decided to follow the regular Jewish calendar was a couple of reasons. First of all, in America, you can't just ask off work at the last minute because that can change yeah. if you follow the Karat calendar. It can change based on... On the, whether that harvest... I mean, you only have a 14-day warning, mm-hmm. and then when you get to the fall feast... Uh, you just have like a day warning because they have to have two witnesses to see the new moon in Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. The other reason was uh, back years ago when God was showing me about the feasts and that the occult were defiling the feasts, it fell on the Jewish calendar date. Yes. Um, so now that could have crossed over on one of these other calendars or or it just might be the date that the occult defiles because the land of Israel is is observing those. But for right now, the Easter is being observed on March 31st. On the regular Jewish calendar, it's, uh, it's April 22nd. On the Karaite calendar, Passover is April 21st. Maybe. And, right, and then on that Zadok calendar, it's April 2nd. So I would just encourage you to pray and, and just seek, seek the Lord. I know on, for us, unless something changes, unless Mike determine something different, we're still going to stick to the regular Jewish calendar. Um, I, I think it's the best we can do right now. Because, and, and, because of days and off And these working. calendars aren't the only calendars that are out there. There's, mm-hmm. there's over 15 different calendars people are promoting and stuff. And so you want to talk about... Well, I believe, too, because we're not in, you know, the land of Israel. God gives us, you know, grace to be able to honor him the best that we can. Yeah. You know, it's it's like when you get to the the fall feast and it's it says that you are to dwell in a, you know, a tent. People in Canada, there are places that there's no way they can dwell in a tent. It's too cold yeah. outside. So, yeah. I I believe that it's it's a personal. I think this is going to come down to to what you think the Holy Spirit's leading you. I I think it's very very difficult in the United States um when you've got you have to a lot of places you have to give like a month or two ahead if you're going to take a series of days off. And then you're lucky if you get it then. And yeah. so so that's the, the reasons that we decided to go with the regular Jewish calendar. Mike is doing some research that may change. We'll let you know if if he finds out. Well, if something. it does, I'll do a whole teaching. Yeah, on he'll it. do a teaching. Uh, on but it, I mean, but even even with and when we when you look at the commandments of God, some are very very specific. Like, you know, during Tabernacles, if you want to take your family out and, and go bivouac somewhere, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're free to do that. But the, for, as a requirement from God, that when it comes to Tabernacles, you have to be a native-born Israelite living in the land of Israel. That's why the, you're required to do it. All the rest of it, we can do it if we want. And at my age... If I'm going to bivouac, I prefer to do it in a condominium. I tell people I'll go play with you in the woods, but I'm going back to my condo at night. I did too much of that when I was in the army. But it, it, as long as you keep, as long as you make it Christ centric, the uh, the whole thing about tabernacles is the return of Christ and Almighty God tabernacling among us, and it's the beginning of the millennial reign. 
And if, if we keep that focus and, and uh, don't, just, don't just repeat things because it's, it's Jewish, uh, one of the things I'm going to get into in this teaching that is, as I begin researching, and this is according not to a Gentile statement, but to the, according to the Encyclopedia Judaica, that modern Judaism is a blending of, of, uh, of uh, Mosaic law and Hinduism. I mean, the Kabbalistic tree of life predates Jews ever using. It goes back to Hinduism. And so we, we've got to be careful. We, we need to look, and the New Testament interprets the Old Testament, not the Talmud. The only thing the Talmud is good for, as far as I'm concerned, is looking at historical things, because they do document historical things. They may document, well, this is the way things were done in the temple, uh, in, the, in the second temple period. Those are great things, but their theology is really way off, and it's gotten so off to the place that uh, a friend of mine, Dr. Carl Koch, last time he was over in Israel, uh, and God had him strike up friendships with some leading rabbis. And uh, Carl just has the, the ability to do that. And uh, they begin sharing with him, say, we, we see Bible prophecy being fulfilled that excites us. And he's thinking, okay, is it preparing for the return of Messiah? What is it? And they point to Zephaniah, one that Mary, you and I would read over and, and just skip. And they confess that we don't even know how to keep the Mosaic law anymore because there's been so much rabbinical teaching and all this. Zephaniah prophesied that one day Gentiles would come to Israel speaking our language and they were going to teach us Moses. And Mary, that's exactly what's happening. Mm-hmm. We, we, have, we have a lot of biblical scholars that are going over there that are feast-keeping, commandment-keeping, and they're going back to the simplicity of Moses, and, and, and they're teaching rabbis over in Israel Moses. Mm-hmm. And the, mo, the, the rabbis are freaking out, saying this is one of the greatest signs of biblical prophecy that we have yeah, ever seen. That's right. And so we, we've got to be careful. It has to be Christ-centric. And uh, this is going to make sense when, when I get into this. Uh, guys, we have been lulled to sleep in the midst of battle because we have forgotten what the battle is. It's not just uh, demonic manifestations. You know, we have a lot of ministries dealing with deliverance, and I think there's uh, concepts of self-deliverance that anytime God shows you to repent of something, you, command, you not only repent of it, you command anything that came to you that established that lie or whatever, or established that sin to leave you. And there's a lot of self-deliverance that can happen as a part of the natural sanctification process, as well as those that need more help. But we have completely forgotten about the second heaven realities. And so I want to deal with that because, Mary, there is not a single nation on the earth that is under the control of Jesus. There are people in those nations that are, but every single nation, and I'm going to prove it a minute to include Israel, that are under fallen principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness. And the first one I want to do is out of Deuteronomy 32 and 8, and this is when God came down and judged the nations, or judged Babylon, and all, all, the, the, all the people gathered together in one city, under the control of Nimrod, and they built a tower, and it was a, a tower of rebellion. It was a tower of, of, of going into war against the God of heaven, and I document this in the Shiner Directive. But in Deuteronomy 32, 8, and there's, there's very few places that there's a variance in the text in the Old Testament, that there are manuscripts that read differently. And in the King James, this says that the, 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 uh, the nations were numbered according to the sons of Israel. The sons of Israel didn't even exist in Babylon. But there were other manuscripts that read the sons of God. Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls have come out, which actually predate all the Torah scrolls that we have in modernity. And it reads according to the number of the sons of God. And so it reads this way, when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance. Well, what inheritance did he give them? They just got the reward for the rebellion against God that Nimrod had leagued with principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness that uh, chose to be worshipped rather than to point men to worship God. And because of that rebellion, God came down and he judged them. He confused their languages, and he divided them into 70 nations. Now, 70 nations is a way of saying all of them uh, in, in the ancient world. And so it says when he divided the, the mankind, he fixed the borders of the people according to the number of the sons of God. So God divorced humanity. You're going to rebel against me. You're going to come against these fallen princes of darkness. You can have them. But 
I am going to create, I'm going to go find a man in Babylon and I'm going to make myself my own nation. And there was a guy named Abram that God showed up to and his family. I mean, you want to talk about God making a point. Abram's family made idols for Babylon. That was the family business. And out of that, God says, I want you to leave that business. I want you to leave your family. I want you to leave the land. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a land. And God calls Abram out. Now, from that point on, from Abram all the way to Jesus, all the descendants of Abram were no longer under principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness. Now, they could be part of their judgment, like in Egyptian bondage, Babylonian bondage, was because of the rebellion against God and different things. But God was their deliverer. He was still the God over the descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But that was the only nation. And so these principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness create the culture, the education, the financial system, the political system, and the judicial system of every single culture on planet Earth. The only exception was this little band that got delivered from Egypt that went around Mount Sinai, and God handed them the Torah and said, I'm creating your culture. I'm creating your financial system. I'm creating your religious system. I'm creating your political system. I'm creating your judicial system. And it's all encoded into the commandments of God. And so when they obeyed them, they stayed under God as their ruler. He said, I am king. In fact, originally it was a theocracy, and, they, and finally they said, well, I want to be like other nations. And God said, okay, you know, hey, he even had Moses encoded it. One of these days you're going to rebel, and you're going to say, I'm going to king like everybody else. And they gave him a physical king. We know about Saul. We know about David. But I, I always love how God works things. Because one day the God that said, I'm your king, was born of a virgin and became a man who's coming back in a physical body, who's going to be king. And so God says, you wanted a man? I'm going to become a man. I'm going to redeem you. Then I'm going to become your king. So God always does this. But when, when, when Israel rejected Messiah, and this was a parable that Jesus taught. This is found in Matthew chapter 21. I'm going to start with uh, uh, 42. He teaches a parable about how that uh, God had started the vineyard. And the people running the vineyard took it over, and he sent his prophets. He sent his servants, and they killed the servants. And he said, well, I'll send my son. They'll obey my son. And he said, and you killed his son. That way you could, you could keep the vineyard. And so now he's getting into this is the core of what that parable was about. And it says, and Jesus said to them, have you never, never read in Scripture, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This is the, was the Lord's doing, and is, and is it not marvelous in our eyes? Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruit. That's the church. From the moment they rejected Jesus, Israel fell back under a principality and power. From the time of the cross till now, the only way to get out of the influence of a principality, power, ruler, or darkness is through salvation. The Bible says we have been delivered from the power of darkness the rulership of darkness, into the kingdom of his dear son. And so we're living in this dynamic tension. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. Mm -hmm. Now, part of the problem that we have had with Western culture is that from the very beginning, it has been a blending of the influence of the old gods. When I refer to the old gods, they're, I'm talking about fallen angels and Nephilim. Most of the gods, all the Baals, we're all actually Nephilim that were able to influence humanity after the flood. Their, their spirits lived on. Uh, especially within Protestant cre uh, Christianity began to influence the kingdom of God. People began to get saved. So many people got saved that we began to be salt and light in the earth, and we were helping form laws and cultures by going back to the Word of God. But we also see both in, in Europe and in America that through the Roman Catholic Church, which is the old Roman religion, it's, it's old mystery Babylon with a veneer of Christianity that's really getting thinner by the day. 
Freemasonry, modern rabbinical Judaism, which is a blending of both authentic biblical Judaism and Hinduism, and Islam, the mystery religions have been fighting constantly to take control of humanity. Now, in America, because of Freemasonry, they installed Baal as God over America. They really did. At the very capital. And so this Baal has been influential in the political, judicial, financial makeup of the nation But because of multiple revivals and the influence of Protestant Christianity, we were able to push this demonic pagan influence into the shadows. There was a time that pedophilia was in the shadows, that the LGBT thing, all that was in the shadows. No longer. (laughs) That the Satan worship in the music was in the shadows. All this was in the shadows. But, But something happened. It's because we we lost several truths. Number one, that we were in dynamic tension with and the mechanisms to keep the influence of the, of the old gods minimal. Everything that we're seeing that's going on in America today, that's going on in Europe today, is a neo-pagan revival. Mm-hmm. From all the current movements, the wokeism, all this stuff is the old it gods is. returning. We can, we can go back to ancient Rome and ancient Greece and ancient Babylon and all their belief systems of of sexuality being fluid and all these different things, that's the way it was. It's unbelievable. And and I'm I'm reading a book right now, or several books right now, but one of them talks about how that uh, when, when God would judge Israel, they, it was like during the, the, we always talk about how wonderful Josiah was that he, he turned things around they had for so long had forgotten God. They didn't even know what the Torah was. It was buried in some rubble, but that courtyard was filled with pagan gods and there were orgies going on in the temple and all mm-hmm. these heinous things. And it's a shame all that Josiah did uh, to reform it. It didn't last very long because now within a couple of generations, God actually ends up judging them. They go into Babylonian captivity. But there was, there was a rediscovering of Torah. But they forgot that all this other stuff is constantly pushing on them. Mm-hmm. That that pressure is always there. Now you know it's it's like a balloon. If we create enough pressure on the inside, we can we can push it out and cause yeah. it to expand. But we we've lost that fact somehow or another. We have ignored love not the things of the world because he who loves the world. The love of the Father is not in him. I mean, the Apostle John gets point blank in in First John. We've forgotten that, and we have fallen in love with the world. The modern systems of church building is how to how to be seduced by the world and become more worldly so that we're more acceptable to them. Mm-hmm. We're not supposed to be acceptable no. to them. We're supposed to be the antithesis to them. That's right. That ran, Things that are rancid don't like light, and they don't like salt. But somehow or another, we want the world to be in love with us. We have turned church into entertainment. We have, we have compromised on, on, every, on every rung. And we wonder there's, there's a truth here that either co- we change culture or culture changes us. Yeah, and right now, the culture is dynamically changing mm-hmm. us, and we're doing it for one reason. Money. Because the more rear ends you have in the seat the more money you're going to have in the offering plate. But let me ask you something. What good is it to have 10,000 rear ends and seats on Sunday morning if every one of them are going to hell? Because you're not telling them the truth. You're not teaching them about Jesus. Most of the church today don't even know who they are in Christ. They, they can't tell you why Jesus went to the cross and died for them. They can't tell you that the most natural thing on planet earth for a redeemed soul is to worship God, and they even resent the fact that they've got to worship him. All these things are going on. Guys, we, we need to learn the lesson from Ephesus. Now, you have to... The, the story of Paul in the book of Acts is before he wrote the book, the, the epistle of Ephesus. Now, I, I studied the, the history when I was writing the kingdom priesthood of, from Paul backwards. That city had been there a thousand years. Now, look, we look at America and we think, you know, there's places in America that are old. Imagine that city was a thousand years old before Paul went there and began preaching the gospel. According to their own legend, at its foundation, it was... It was founded by the Amazonian women who worshipped a female, a female deity. And the reason they built Ephesus at that site 
was because they would believe that was near the birthplace of Gaia, Mother Earth. Mm. So when you talk about Mother Earth worship, Earth worship, that's Gaia worship. That was the heart of Ephesus. For a thousand years, they were the epicenter of female worship on planet Earth. Then Paul comes in there preaching another gospel. I bet that went over well. <laughs> Mary, as, as far as I can tell in the timeline, I don't think they were there more than 60 days before this spirit stirred up a riot. Mm -hmm. And if God hadn't moved on a city clerk to calm them down, they would have rose up and killed every believer in Ephesus. Okay. And so now years later, Paul writes them and he, he reminds them, he says, listen, he says, finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to uh, withstand against the schemes of the enemy, the schemes of the devil. For we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against, against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. And so he's reminding them, you're in dynamic tension. You're constantly wrestling mm -hmm. with the very culture around you because it is controlled by this Gaia spirit. This is controlled by Artemis, by Diana. Mm -hmm. I mean, when, when you, you talk about that right and you read the, the book of Ephesians, those people were stomping and shouting, great is Diana, to the place that it was literally shaking the city. I mean, that was, that was even worse than any rock concert you would ever go to. I mean, this thing stirred them up to a crescendo. And Paul is saying, that's what you're wrestling with. Well, America, you're wrestling with the Baal. You're wrestling with the old gods that, are, yeah. that have put you to sleep. That's true. That have told you there's no warfare. Just, just get along with culture. Show identity to culture. If culture's getting tattoos, you get tattoos. If culture's doing this, you do this. And, and don't preach the gospel. Don't preach against sin because we have to be seeker sensitive. No, we don't. We're not supposed to be seeker sensitive. We're to be king sensitive. That when we hold church services, it's to honor Jesus. How can we honor Jesus by falling in love with the world? We can't. We can't. We have forgotten we're in warfare. Now, one thing I didn't do, Mary, and, and when I was researching the kingdom priesthood was to look forward in time to see what happened to the church of Ephesus. And I'm reading a book right now by Erwin Lutzer called The Church in Babylon. He's the pastor at Moody Church. And he'd been up there for like 30 years. Fantastic book, by the way. Uh, but he points out something that uh, I, had, I had forgotten. Because, you know, in Jesus in, in the book of Revelation, in the book of Ephesians, he said, listen, you've lost your first love. The church has lost its first love again, by the way. Yeah, we have. And he says, Ephesus, <laughs> you have lost your first love. If you don't go back and fall back in love with Jesus and the kingdom, Jesus said, I'm going to come and I'm going to take your lampstand out of the place which represents the church. Dr. Letzer documents that eventually, because Ephes, those in Ephesus did not heed the book of Revelation, the church died in Ephesus. I can't imagine that. You know, that, that almost boggles your mind when you read how powerful the book of, Ephesus, of Ephesians is. I it mean, is it is powerful. a deep theological book that it Paul is. did on the top of him teaching there every day for three years. Every day for three but years. Look at the foundation. Like he said, oh, the look foundation, how the strong foundation. that pagan foundation was. And I'm wondering in America, Mary, are we, we, in, a, are we in a situation that, that God is telling the church in America, you've lost your first love. And if you don't go back and do the first works, I'm going to remove the lampstand out of its place well, in America. I, I believe the hope's the remnant. The hope is the remnant. And, and there have been times in prayer that I've cried and I've wept over the faithful pastors. The ones that have, listed, that, have, that have maybe lost three-quarters of their congregation mm -hmm. because they wouldn't compromise with Babylon. And they've wondered how they've kept the doors open. They've wondered, what have I done wrong? I'm here to tell you, buddy, you've done nothing wrong. No. You've done nothing wrong. You stand strong. You stood for the commandments of God. You called sin, sin, and you pointed to that old rugged cross. You pointed to that empty tomb, and you called for a life. There, there are two great mysteries in the Word of God, Mary. One is the mystery of iniquity, which we're seeing flourish on planet Earth. And it's the very force that is going to excel the Antichrist in the power. Mm -hmm. But there's the other one. 
the mystery of godliness. The church has lost the mystery of godliness. In fact, I love the way the Apostle Paul starts out the book of Romans. He said, it wasn't the spirit of power that rose Christ from the dead. It was the spirit of holiness. Because there, there's the conflict we see in 1 John. There's the Antichrist spirit fighting against Jesus. There is the spirit of error fighting against the spirit of truth. We have got to embrace truth with both hands like our life depends on it because it do. does. It really does. We, and we, look we, at, look at this morning when we turned on the news, and the number one thing they were talking about was the – was it what was it last night? I don't even know the name. Was it the Academy Awards the Oscars. or was it the Oscars? Um, and they, they – you know, they're mostly talking about like the dresses these people wore. Most of them look like clown outfits to me. And I thought putting so much emphasis on this and getting so excited about this, and I thought, oh, my word – America's fallen apart all around them. They're, and they're, that's we're we're what creating they're secular to. idols as they're being handed an idol for their accomplishment. Golly gee. Okay. This, this is the world that we're living in. When, when the news media today, it's all about distraction, distraction and propaganda. You open up the Word of God, and I tell you what, the Word of God is more true now than it ever has been. We're, we're seeing the beginnings see more of, of, the, of the, being fulfilled. <laughs> the, the son of perdition's getting ready to walk onto the stage and say, how do you like me now? And half the church is going to be in love with him. Mm -hmm. Or what they call themselves the church, they're not. Uh, I was watching one pastor, and I may not agree with all of his theology because he's a cessationist. But he did say one thing. He said a lot of these churches have become nothing but goat farms. Mm-hmm. And then we look to a goat farm on how to take care of sheep. You can't. No. You can't, guys. No comparison. Guys, the reality is as long as we're in this world and Jesus is not ruling and reigning physically in Jerusalem, we're in war. We are living in hostile territory. Yeah, we are. At the very cultures around us, either we change those cultures or the cultures change us. Either we're salt and light in the earth. Now, the scary part about being, and we're all called to be salt in the earth. When you fall in love with the rancidity of the earth, you don't become salt in it. Salt is a preserving factor. Mm -hmm. And what, what did Jesus say happens to salt when it loses its savor? It's good for nothing. <laughs> it's trampled under the feet of men. Now you know why the world has lost respect for the church. Mm-hmm. There was a time in America, politicians would have to do stuff behind closed doors and hiding and under whispers because they feared the church. Now when three quarters of, the, of what is called the church is under their control, they're coming out of the closets. Mm -hmm. They're coming out of the back rooms and the shady dealings. And, they're, and, and they, yeah, I, am, I am shocked at the boldness of some of this stuff. It's because they've got away with it for so long. Yeah. But, you know, I was, was wondering about... Um, you know, this eclipse that they say, you know, the one in 2017 came down one way and the other one. And I, I heard somebody say the other day, it looks like the Confederate flag. It's, it, it's an X. An X marks the spot, which is Little Egypt in um, Illinois. And I was sitting there and I remembered what one of the program multiples <sighs> did one day. You know, they would do these little slight things. And, and what he was doing was pointing to his Time X watch. And I really don't know what the part of me that was, was sitting there meant by this, but they said something along the lines of, yeah, there's a time X coming, but it's not going to be what you think. Yeah. Almighty God's going to show up. And, and the truth <laughs> is, I mean, when they do, even when they do the X, that was one of the symbols of, of Tammuz. Yes, I heard somebody say it was a symbol of, of something in, that was good, and I thought I've always heard that it was not. So well, when you when you look at the Aleph Tav, the Aleph Tav, the Aleph represents the power, and Tav is covenant. But one of the symbols for the Tav was an X, because I think it represented the cross. The cross was not only the T shape, like we know, but was also an X historically. But it was all the enemies of the mystery religions were crucified. That's why the Romans crucified anybody. That, uh, that came against them because they ruled under the authority of Tammuz. Mm. Now, they may have called him Mithra and many other things, 
But it, it's it's the, the thing that Samarimus established within Babylon. Well, but, that's what I'm kind of worried about this eclipse is, you know, there's so many different things that people are saying and numbers and, and all that stuff. But I just think whatever the enemy has planned, you watch, Almighty God. He is getting ready to make a move that is going to shock the world. I don't know when it's going to happen or how he's going to do it, but I know it's coming. And here's one of the things that I have determined. Now, when you, I think it was Josh Peck we were listening to that talked about how you was, one was supposed to go through Jer, uh, Salem, all those cities of Salem. That was the first one in and 2017. Nineveh, uh, I, th- I think it was, wasn't it Josh Peck that said that they, they went nearby, them, but they didn't actually dissect. Yeah, there was the, just two of the Salems. It went right through, and then two of the Ninevehs is what Yeah, the rest said. of them, it was kind of, they were nearby, so it, it wasn't a direct line. This is what Jesus said. Signs are for those who don't believe. That's, that's the Apostle Paul. Signs are for the one who's talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Signs are for those that don't believe. I don't need a sign in the heaven. I have a more written, sure word of prophecy, the word of God. Now, we're going to see freaky signs in the heavens. Yeah, we're going to see a lot Bible of things. <laughs> but, you know, and, and the truth is these can be manipulated. And one of the things we're dealing about with uh, is, you know, the coming alien, space alien invasion. Uh, I agree with Joseph Z that it could be, uh, number one, our own technology that we've reverse engineered from, from the crash ships. Uh, it could be them coming. It could also be Project Blue Beam. And it may be uh, D, all the above, uh, as part of the great delusion. That's why if we stand strong in the truth of the word, you'll yeah. be okay. But when you have That's Project where the Blue Beam, is. <laughs> they, they can fake anything in the skies and, and, uh, and, ha- and have drones causing all kinds of havoc and saying it's the aliens. I mean, there's, we're, we're living in a time that uh, that we we're living in a stew of deception and the only thing that is true in all the world right now is the word of god that's it and everything else is in this strong witch's brew mm-hmm. of deception so much so that they will attack the salt. They'll attack anything that doesn't line up with their delusion. They will. But, you know, I've said all along <clears throat> that as these attacks increase, um, God's going to stop the plans of the enemy as far as, like, <clears throat> what the elite are doing. Yeah. Now, God's going to have to judge some things. We know that. Um, and I'm not saying that there aren't going to be some great shakings. I truly believe there are. But I'll tell you one thing that I know this. Almighty God's going to let them go to a certain point, and then he's going to say, stop. Yeah. And when he says stop, everything they've planned for centuries will come to a stop. Yes. Doesn't mean all the evil's going to leave. It means that God's going to show up and say, for this last great revival and all of these young people that you have so worked and planned and schemed to get in your pocket and think that there's no way that I can deliver them from all of the mind control and everything that, they've, that has happened to their minds through what you've projected through the airways, watch me turn it around. Yes. Watch him. Watch him turn things around that the enemy says is impossible. We serve the God that does impossible things. <laughs> We do. And he's still on the throne. He's still almighty. Yeah. I, I go back to, I think it's Daniel eleven thirty two that when the Antichrist is at his zenith, there's going to be this remnant that's going to mm-hmm. be his, his uh, thorn in the flesh. Because as he's doing great signs and wonders, they're going to be doing great signs and wonders for the kingdom. Real and ones. Real ones, <laughs> and it's going to stop him on that. And, on and I totally, I never heard anybody else say that. But me, cause, and I always have been looking for confirmation, and Jeremiah Johnson said it that, that last time, that he said everybody's wanting the glory to show up. But he said, remember, when the glory shows up, God deals with evil in that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right now if the glory would show up, almost half the church would be called Ananias and Sapphira. Mm, it, it, was, it really concerns me. It does. We, uh, and which leads me to believe, Mary, and, and this, we can just put this into the thing. I don't think the church in the last couple of hundred years has seen the glory of God. I think, except for places like during the great revivals of Finney, when the glory of God would come, and I, I think in a weak measure into a city, all the sinners began to cry out for salvation. Yeah, and bars would close. and 
brothels would close, you know, everything would close. But the strongholds have built, <laughs> yep. and things have built to such a degree that uh, it's really going to be some warfare like nobody's ever seen. But you know what? If if the captain of the host is leading us, we'll get it done. We'll get it done. It, it'll be all right. And we're going to make it through. The Bible talks in the, the book of Revelation actually repeats several times. And it talks about at the end of the tribulation period that there's this multitude beyond what you can even count <laughs> whose robes have been washed yes. white that come out of that great tribulation that's period. That's right. And that's, boy, I tell you what, I live for that. You say, well, Mike, I thought we were supposed to get out of here beforehand. You know what? Jesus can come back for us anytime he wants to. Yes. But... We're so looking forward to it. I am. I have determined that I'm preparing. And and, and and Dr. Walter Martin said this when he had a lot of pre-tribbers try to pin him down. He says, guys, here's what I do. I prepare for post and I pray for pre. Because when we, we were all fixed on a pre-tribulation rapture, nobody's getting prepared. Nobody, nobody's toughening up because they're saying God's going to get us out of here before it gets very bad. Well, let me tell you something. Over in China, it's bad. <laughs> the, the reason that Christianity survived in China and there's no pre-tribbers in China is because all the pre-tribbers said, God's going to get us out of here before it ever gets very bad, before the, before the communists take control. They all were slaughtered by the Chinese. But the ones who believed in the post-trib all ran to the mountains because they said, Jesus said, "For if you're living in Jerusalem and you see this, run to the mountains, so that's good enough for us, and they ran to the mountains. Even the Jewish community, Mary, and, and the, the horrors, and, I, and uh, let me tell you something, the Holocaust was real, okay? It was real. I'd, uh, I, I hear Christians trying to deny the Holocaust. It makes me want to uh, slap some sense into them. Same spirit's working today. But Mary, the, 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 the reason that so many Jews are secular today is because their parents and grandparents were told by the rabbis, Messiah will come back before it gets too bad, and he won't let this happen to us. They were unprepared. They could have actually stood up and took a stand against what the Nazis were doing. The, the, Jew, the German people could have too, but they were seduced either into, into being um, to placate to them and surrender to them or just a, a fear of them. Because when you look at the Nazi party, the Nazi party was actually about 8% of Germany took over. What would have happened if the 92% would have stood up? Well, I think it was quite the strategy of the enemy. And, that so, whole situation. and so here's, here's I am, I, I'm trying to develop the mindset that I may have to go through this whole thing. You may have to go through this whole thing. So it's time to learn spiritual warfare. It's time to toughen up. It's time to say, I don't care what happens. I don't care if the whole world follows the Antichrist. I'm following Jesus. I don't care if everybody I know receives the mark of the beast. I'm not receiving the mark of the beast. Right. I will be found faithful. I will live and I will die by the fidelity that I have to Jesus That's and the it. word of God. You see, when you have that stand, you see, that's the stand Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego had to have. That's what got them through the fiery furnace. They said, oh, king, we ain't bowing. Yeah, that's right. And whether God delivers us or not, we ain't bowing. And they threw them in, and he looked in, and he said, didn't we just throw three in the fire? He said, there's this fourth man in the fire It looks like the Son of God. You want Jesus to show up? Then you get into a life and death situation, and you refuse to bow. Yeah. I'm not, I, I, I am not denying him. I am not giving into the world system. I will walk in Damn. love. That's right. But I will, you know, they, they, didn't, they didn't call the king names and said, oh, king, we're not going to do this. Now, we respect you, but we can't do this because we respect God more. And they made it, and we're going to make it. God's going to make it, and we're going to stay on this planned path. We're going to throw off every pagan thing, yes. and we're going to get with the, with what God wants us to do. Yes. And I ask him to show us more every day. I, I know that there's more that we need to, to see, more we need to discern, and I ask him for, for your remnant, Father, show us that yes. path. Show us that path. Father, Jesus. I ask that you would do some surgery to the body right now, Father, that where the enemy has weakened our backbones, that you would strengthen our backbones. Yes. Father, that you would give us a resolve. I want Jesus and Jesus alone. I want your word. I want your kingdom alone. 
that I'll not be moved by hype, I'll not be moved by the cunning of men or the moving of principalities and powers, but I will be moved by my king and my king alone. And that I will live for Jesus, I'll die for Jesus, and everything is Jesus from beginning to end. And I will be faithful. It's because I love Jesus I keep the commandments. It's because I love Jesus that I walk in the ways of God. It's because I love him that I'm walking contrary to the world. Because that world system, the Apostle John said, Father, is already passing away. And one of these days it's going to hit a brick wall called the return of my king who's going to kosher this planet. And the Antichrist and the false prophet are both going to be thrown into the lake of fire. Satan's going to be bound for a thousand years. Oh, I can't wait, Mary. I can't wait. I can't wait. You see, that's the day that, that Jeremiah prophesied about. It's Jeremiah 33, which is also connected to the new birth. He said, one of these days, He said, you're going to tell people, know the Lord. You're going to tell people, these are the ways of God. And he said, you're not going to be able to find anybody that doesn't know. I love that. Oh, I'm (laughs) I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to that. And so everybody's going to know, but you know what the heart cry is going to be? Even the remnant then, take me deeper. Mm -hmm. Take me deeper. Take me deeper. Then we can go higher. (laughs) I want to be like Moses, that when it was time for Moses to go, one of the last things he said to God was, oh, God, but I've just begun to see your glory. And then Paul tells us, in the ages to come, he's taken us deeper, and he's taken us deeper, and he's taken us deeper. Mary, we got an eternity to go deeper in God. the, The God that we serve the seraphim that have been there since they were created, that saw him create the universe, they cry out, holy, 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 24-7, Over 365, <laughs> ever since the creation. And, and when you read the commentators, they say the reason they do that is every time they get up to holy, 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 they get another glimpse of something more splendor. More, more wonderful than they saw before, and it causes them to start all over again. And then they've got to start all over again. No wonder Paul says that there's this glory and knowledge that we have that shines in the face of Jesus. We're going to see glimpses of it soon. Yes, we are. We're going to see glimpses of our king. We're going to see yes. glimpses of the kingdom. We're going to see men's hearts. He's going to refine us. Melt. Hearts of stone are going to melt and yes. become fleshly hearts once again. Father, first do it in your people. Yes. Give us a warrior spirit yes, to fight Father. and live for our king. And, Father, let us have a conquest of winning souls to the kingdom, to be free from principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. And we'll not bow our knee. We're going to see the fire of God. Yes. We're going to see how you can turn hungry lions into nothing but a pillow for your saints, Father. And we just thank you and we praise you for it. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.